one uh, Zoom session, and we hope we'll host a few of these before the end of the year. We, we remain at your disposal, you know, to discuss your requirements related to medical risk protection. So if there's any requirements that you need there, please don't hesitate, but give us a shout. So let us know, uh, should you require more information about the Genoa malpractice cover? You know, we'll be able to give you more information on that. Or should you just require a quote, you know, to compare just to see whether you're getting value for money? We'll also be able to do that for you. And also, should your cover come, um, you know, kind of elapse or about elapse, we can also, you know, just before you renew, we can also give you an um, option to look at, you know, so that we can present to you the best product that comes from, uh, from Genoa and we can, you know, give you competitive prices. So you hope that we will find this session fruitful and informative and thank you and enjoy and we're looking forward to engaging you further uh, on your needs in terms of the malpractice. Thank you. I'll hand over to, to Maxwell now. We seem to be struggling with Maxwell. I think he's talking, but we can't hear him. Um, Michael, I'm not, I'm not sure if you would want to. Can you hear Maxwell? Um, no, unfortunately to me, I can't hear him. Um, Maxwell, I don't know if you wanted to see whether you can get your speakers working. Alternatively, we'll hand directly to, to Dr. Ira, and we'll give you an opportunity to address the members at the end. Okay, unfortunately, yeah, so Maxwell seems to be having some problems. So Brad, yeah. with that, over to you, sir. All right, well, I'll allow good you to morning, everyone. Thank you. Good morning to everyone as we uh, kick off and happy Saturday to you. I know that um, we are flooded at the moment with um, Zoom calls and online training and everything that goes with that. So it's, it's absolutely wonderful to be here with you and it's wonderful that you're here with me. And um, thank you to everyone for putting this together. Today, we, we, we're gonna address what defines a medical error do some tools and maybe go through some checklists so that you can have a look in your practice and say, are you possibly advertently or inadvertently committing some errors? We're gonna look at the definitions of social media and we will talk about social media risks. But I wanted to share with you as we kick off and we go through the, um, the next hour together, my experience yesterday. So I was in the practice yesterday and I found myself scrubbing up to my elbows. Now this is private practice, but cleaning up to my elbows, fingertips to elbows, cleaning all the surfaces and having a consultation in a mask. And it reminded me of my world as the risk manager in a variety of different hospital situations and how in those situations, we take those as normal clinical practice. You go into the wardroom, you sanitize your hands, you uh, make sure that your, your gown and your, um, your clothing is, is, is as hygienic as possible. And when you leave that ward, you sanitize your hands again and you walk out. And I realized how what is the norm, norm and normal in some circumstances is not always the norm and normal in others. And as we go through this presentation today and, and, and I challenge you with questions about what you may or might, may not be doing in your practice, I find myself challenging myself in those things on an everyday basis. Everything from room readiness to patient conduct to informed consent to uh, post-consultation hygiene and um, we're going to go through that as as we talk today uh, we're also going to talk a lot about introspection and the idea at the end of this presentation and the first time i did this presentation uh, we spent a lot of time talking about what you can see on the screen there errors by commission and errors by omission but i'm also going to introduce a concept uh, that came through very strongly this week, which is called the Mende concept. And the Mende concept says that it's not only the mere opinion of the witness that's uh, decisive, but the ability to satisfy the courts in this case, that their specific skills, training and experience gives their opinion merit. And I raise that because there was a court case that happened this week where the Constitutional Court 
overruled a guilty verdict on a obstetrician gynecologist. And, and that's a great thing. But they overturned it one year after he'd spent 10 months in, in, in jail and then been released on, <coughs> on correctional supervision. So I, I share that with you because that's a contemporary judgment from this week that shows and illustrates how important it is for us to be aware that patient safety incidents are very real and have very real consequence for us. So as we go forward into today and we talk about the concept of medical professional indemnity within the construct of a medical error, one would do well to appreciate that in every 100 consultations we do, between one and 24 consultations have patient safety incidents. And a patient safety incidence is one where there is a risk of an adverse outcome, either because of what we've done, which is an error by commission, and a medication prescription error where you put the wrong medicine or you've written it illegibly or the dosage is wrong would be an error by commission. A procedure error, uh, a cut that's too deep or a, um, a uh, injection that's slightly in the wrong area or any other procedure that you do would be considered to be an error by commission, an error of something you've done. On the other hand, an error by omission is an error that's caused by something you didn't do, a failure to take the right action, a task that you left out, care that you missed, a question that you didn't ask in the case history, all become parts of an error by omission. And at this point, as we go through this, I would ask you then to consider, do you have a checklist that you follow step by step by step for how you take your, your, your case history, how you reach your diagnostic opinion, how you decide on the course of treatment that you provide, how you communicate that to your patient, how you get consent for those treatments, and then how you do follow up post treatment. And there's a, there's a book many of you who've heard me speak before will have heard um, me talk about it. And if you haven't, I'm going to share it with you now. The author is a chap called Atul Gawande, and the book is called The Checklist Manifesto. Now, this is one of a number of books, but what I particularly like about Atul Gawande's book. Atul Gawande is a general surgeon who did a lot of work for the World Health Organization on looking at quality improvements in patient care and patient safety, specifically in low medium income countries, which includes um, our own. And what he found during his research and subsequently wrote in his books was that we often make an error as a consequence of what we have left out. And what we've left out is because we don't have a checklist. So he wrote this book, Checklist Manifesto, encouraging us to make checklists so that we don't make either errors by commission, but especially we don't result in errors by omission that result in lapses in care. So on that, I, I joke about this to, to say when, when I was in the 80s, when I, when I applied, the joke was you hand wrote your application and you hand wrote your application. And if people could read your application, they threw it out. And if they couldn't read your application, you were uh, invited to go and study. I re recall an early conversation when I first started in practice. And so my first year in clinical private practice was already 25 years ago. And at that stage, one of the pharmacist jokes and said, I'm just going to type out the, the, the names of the medicines that I'm, I'm going to uh, expect from that will come from you. And I want you to handwrite next to each type um, description, your, your narrative. And I said, well, why? He said, because I'm not going to be able to read your writing. I'm just going to compare it and best guess it. And unfortunately, what that does, and, and it's still true now, I see a lot of medical certificates. I see a lot of um, uh, clinical notes that, that, that um, we've made in our practices, and they're largely illegible. And if it's largely illegible and a third party cannot read it, that is both an error by commission because you've written illegibly and an error of omission because you have failed to uh, create and keep handwritten legible notes. And handwritten legible notes are a requirement under your registration, specifically in terms of the record keeping, which is booklet nine of the Health Professions Council. So it's, it's, it's good for you to have a look at that. And in a separate discussion, not today, we talk a lot about that. But uh, please have a look at your notes and say, are my notes legible? They are or they aren't. Can another person read my notes in my absence? Well, they can or they can't. I, I like to use clin um, electronic records now. But I've got a partner who says, you'll have to prize my pen from my cold dead fingers before I stop writing contemporaneous handwritten notes. 
It doesn't matter which style you use, but it does matter that you do it well. So let's go through and, and, and look at some definitions. And as we start these definitions now, I'm reminded to suggest to you, if you've got a question on anything we're talking about today or anything around what you perceive or are concerned to, to be a medical error or a social media risk, just put it in the chat, type it, and I'll answer them as best I can in real time. It makes the conversation a little bit more dynamic as well. So what is a medical error by its definition? A medical error is an error or omission of diagnosis or treatment or the procedure or what you perform or the supervision or timeliness that results in the perceived, the putative, the perceived injury to patients. It's, it doesn't have to be the actual injury, but it, it's a perceived injury. Now, this can be a medical misadventure or it can be clinical negligence. And there's a couple of tests for this, but I'm going to refer you to some fairly old cases because the rules that were there back from already the 1920s are still the rules that apply now. And the principal rule is that when we look at what you've done or failed to do, in other words, what you've commissioned or by omission, we look at it in terms of the application of the necessary skills that comply with the standards of the reasonable practitioner with the same or similar training to you. So the comparison that's made, and I spoke to you earlier about that Mende um, uh, requirement in courts, comes out of uh, uh, the Mende uh, trial. But the important thing is that you as a practitioner are held to a standard of care higher than the reasonable person because the reasonable person doesn't have your level of expertise and training. So you are held to the level of a reasonable practitioner with same or similar training to you. So as you go through your practice and you start saying, let's understand that adverse outcomes happen. Why do they happen? Because complications happen. If complications are known outcomes as a result of your treatment. They are known unfortunate outcomes. The question that you have to, to make sure of in answering properly is have you minimized the likelihood of those adverse outcomes and have you recorded them appropriately and the risks of them and does your patient understand that it's not only enough that you tell this to a patient the patient has to recognize and understand what you've said to them in a way that they can firstly appreciate that what they they're uh, acknowledging and giving you permission to do or that they're acknowledging and accepting to do for themselves is within a range of what they understand so that becomes important because when we start looking at clinical negligence, the thing that gets you into trouble in the courts or in a settlement, there's the distinction between the medical misadventure, which is regarded as excusable because an error of judgment may or may not be negligent, and a mistake, which often is considered to be negligence. Okay? And the, the, the test for this largely, not exclusively, but largely, is it, depending on the error uh, and depending on whether a reasonable practitioner in other words, someone with your training who is in a same or similar circumstance to you doing what you're doing has a consequence that leads to the same outcome. Now, you'll see at the bottom there, there's a, a, a court case from Van Bacon Lewis from 1924. And there, the, com the comment, and I, I talk about Van Bacon Lewis from time to time through this presentation too, the true nature of the inquiry is into the reasonableness of the conduct of the practitioner. Or the practitioner. So the question is not whether there was an outcome which resulted in damage to the patient or a consequence to the patient. The question is whether when you made this error of judgment, whether it was negligence or not, against the test of the reasonableness of conduct. So I'd like you to think about what you're doing in your practice every day and start asking yourself the question is, would my decision match those in the expectation of what my colleagues might do in a similar circumstance. And if I was called as a practitioner, whomever me is, if I was called to compare the criteria of another practitioner where there's a patient complaint to what the reasonable standard would be, would you be able to do that? Do you understand the guidelines in your clinical specialty? Do you apply those guidelines in a reasonable and responsible way? If your answer is yes, you're doing great. If your answer is no, there's some introspection there. And into doing that, I would refer you uh, to the Health Professions um, Council's uh, booklet on um, ethical guidelines. And 
you can download that booklet. It's a, it's a reduced or restricted 334 odd pages of booklets, and all the booklets are included in that. But booklet one, which speaks about your ethical responsibilities as a practitioner, includes informed consent and record keeping and conduct to your, your patients and conduct to your colleagues. And so it's, I, I think, a very good exercise for you to go back as, we, as you start in your practice to consider what clinical negligence may or may not mean, to say, what are my criteria for reasonableness in my practice? And do I follow those criteria on an everyday basis? So let's define a medical error just on the context of that. And the first thing about a medical error is it's considered to be a preventable, keyword, adverse effect of care. Now, those two keywords, preventable and adverse effect of care, should be high on your mind every day when you're seeing the patient. It doesn't matter whether there was uh, evidence of it and whether it was harmful to the patient. But you may have dodged a bullet and the patient doesn't suffer harm. But if there was an aspect of your care that was preventable and resulted in an adverse outcome, in other, in other words, a patient safety incident, it would be regarded as a medical error. Now that would include an inaccurate or incomplete diagnosis. It would include an inaccurate or incomplete treatment. And that treatment being inaccurate or incomplete could be of a disease, an injury, a syndrome, a behavior, an infection, or any other ailment and or all of the above. So it's not to say that the preventable adverse outcome or, or lapse or failure of care is always negligent. It may or may not be negligent, but it's considered negligent if you fail to comply with the, re with the reasonable medical standards. So again, if you ask yourself, how are you doing in your practice? Are you complying with reasonable um, standards? An example, of this, an example of this for you to consider, specifically, there was a case called the mini case. And these are, these are reported and, and publicly accessible cases. So I'm sharing with you information that is in the public domain. But in the mini case, this is a, a, a woman who suffered the signs of a, of, of a uh, transient ischemic attack and a, and a stroke. She saw that one general practitioner. She um, went back the next day and saw a separate practitioner, both who gave her, in hindsight, reasonable advice. Her actions, the contributory negligence, and their actions together resulted at the end of the day, directly, indirectly, or perceivably, in her having a full-blown cerebrovascular accident and suffering significant disability. It took several years and appeals before the practitioners were found to have actually complied with the appropriate clinical guidelines. But you could imagine if your practice was under a cloud and you were being um, un under scrutiny and involved in litigation for five to seven years, what that might mean in your practice. So the, the issue that ultimately allowed this case to pivot the way that it did was that they were able to show that they did comply with reasonable medical standards and guidelines but it took 60 months to get to that point. So the Joint Commission, uh, a, a US-based international um, working organization that looks at hospital-related risks and clinical uh, efficiency and patient safety, they created a taxonomy for medical errors. When they looked at the taxonomy for medical errors, they looked at it in terms of five key things. They looked at the impact of the error. And we're, I'm gonna show you on the next slide, an example of what impact might look like. They looked at the type of error, whether it was an error by commission or an error by omission. They looked at it that type in terms of um, the decision-making process and the guidelines. They looked at it in the domain, and the domain in this case is the setting whereby um, the, the uh, incident occurred in the office, in the hospital, and in the hospital, ER, OR, OPD, the ICU, the nursing unit, they looked to see if it was in the ambulatory care environment or in the day clinic environment, whether it was in the rehab or the nursing home or hospice. In our case, we could add another block to that now and say, did this happen in a remote or a digital consultation setting, like a telemedicine or telehealth setting? And then we look at it in terms of what caused the error and was the error preventable? So when one looks at an error, one doesn't only look at the adverse outcome, one looks at the these three areas to decide 
how significant your care was or lack of care was and what the impact of that may be. So when we look at the impact component, we look at it in terms of the degree of harm. We separate it into two broad categories. The first category of the impact that we look at is the medical category, and the second is the non-medical category. So in the medical category, we, we would look at it in terms of three Ps. We're going to look at two of those three now, and that's physical, psychological, and physiological. And under the non-medical, we look at it in terms of legal, social, and economic. Now, legal, social, and economic are the, are the pieces that uh, I suppose get us a lot into, into the difficulties that we have because when we start looking at the economic impact, we look at the health shock. Let's say I come and see you and you perform maybe a good but maybe a less than good um, examination on me. And you may or may not miss something as a consequence of that. Um, I've got a note that says, you can't hear anything. Please just let me know if, uh, if the sound is good. Nothing's changed on, on my side here. Sounds working, Brad. Okay, thank you. So when we look at this, you treat me, and as a consequence of treating me, I have an adverse outcome, and the result of that is I can't work, which means I can't earn, which means I have a health shock. That health shock means that I can no longer afford my activities of daily living, and I can't necessarily include my social um, commitments, my bonds, my uh, school fees, buying food, or my care. Once that starts to happen, we get into the legal implications of did you or didn't you fail in terms of your contractual obligations, not to mention your professional and social obligations to me. So those would be what the non-medical implications are. And oftentimes when I started in, in, in um, supporting medical negligence, and uh, clinical negligence and medical professional indemnity uh, parties. And I'm new to this. I've only been doing this since 2001. So I'm still figuring it out as we go. But one of the biggest issues that's come out, certainly in the last couple of years, was the fact that people say there was a treatment, there was an outcome that was adverse, and I still got a bill. And some of the biggest arguments that we find in, um, in settlements or in disputes and claims is the, um, is the issue as it relates to the financial obligations or the financial consequences that you as the practitioner didn't explain to the patient in a manner that they understood. So when they get the bill from you, there's a level of anger, there's a level of desperation, there's a level of frustration, there's a level of mistrust that leads to dispute. So bear that in mind that the impact in terms of a, of a medical error, especially in terms of an a, um, error by omission, what you've left out, is an error that affects the non-medical side of, of the care of that patient. If we look at the, uh, the, the, the physical or the psychological um, impacts, you'll note there, if I build the slide down, that we go from no harm or no undetectable harm. So we can find that there's a small amount of harm all the way down to temporary or permanent severe or profound harm. Now, in a psychological basis or a psychological it's really hard to figure that out. If you think about it, if I say to you, I've got pain, how do you classify that pain? Do you use a visual analog scale? Do you use a color bar, a free association scale? Are you using some form of cognitive behavioral therapy to assess uh, as, a, as a technique to assess my perception of pain or my environment or my function? And if you don't record that at the beginning of the treatment and in the middle and at the end of the treatment, if it's over a period of weeks, how do you know, or how does a third party know that what the patient is complaining about and what you've been diligent about match? It's the same on the physical side. There's either no harm or there is no undetectable harm. In other words, I can see harm, and that goes right the way down to death. Now, in those areas before death, looking at functional incapacity, looking at functional impairment, looking at functional disability, looking at temporary and permanent disability or perceived disability becomes really, really difficult. And the reason that I put these two up together is there is a still surprisingly a tremendous amount of people who have issue regarding um, abdominal pain. They present to the ER or they present to the GP and there is a missed early diagnosis of appendicitis. Or maybe... It wasn't appendicitis in the first thing, it was an acute abdomen, 
that results in a secondary appendicitis. I don't have an opinion on that. But there is a physical component to that with temporary uh, moderate to severe harm and possibly permanent harm depending on the severity of the uh, acute infection and secondary sepsis. But equally, there is a moderate to severe temporary or permanent harm to the state of that person's emotional range and their sense of their own vitality. One is, is, is more difficult to measure than the other. But often when we then start to, to um, have discussions with these patients, they say, but I had five surgeries. I say, yes, but you've got a tiny scar and everything is fine and you're healthy again. They say, yes, but emotionally it was so hard. And so when you calculate the impacts, especially in terms of the psychological impacts, please bear in mind that it's very, very difficult to quantify for yourself or from a, a third party what that was if you weren't doing the right kind of, of, of early assessment. Later on, and, and, and um, you'll, you'll, you'll smile when we get to that, there is a statement that says, if you're doing a procedure that is a scheduled procedure, the longer the space of time between when you schedule the procedure and the procedure is done, the higher level of patient anxiety there is. The higher the level of patient anxiety, the worse their perceived post-operative or post-procedural outcome is, is expected to be. So link that back to this and understand that if you're scheduling a procedure with a patient 10 days, two weeks, a month away, you should also be considering how to manage the psychosocial and emotional components that may or may not lead to a perceived poor outcome. That perceived poor outcome falls into the category of medical error. It's a adverse outcome that may or may not be actual, but it's perceived, it's putative, and it's um, through the interpretation of the patient. So if we change gears slightly here, we look at the 10 most common medical errors that you may or may not experience. Um, these often interrelate, and you'll see these five and the next five joined together. Your technical medical error, your, your error by commission, is a technical medical error. Your failure to use indicated tests or avoidable delay in treatment are errors by omission. Failure to take precaution, failure to act on test results are errors by omission. The avoidable delay in care. If you did something that led to that uh, delay, that's an error by commission. So understand that not doing your tests, not taking precautions, not acting on test results is as significant as the actions that you do take. Some that um, we, and, and, and I pause as I say this, some that we possibly don't do as well as we could do is post-procedure monitoring, post-discharge monitoring, inadequate patient preparation prior to the procedure, not only uh, timeouts and confirming uh, site of surgery, but the emotional and psychological preparation, the informed consent component of the uh, patient understanding that they may come to, to uh, a point where immediately post-procedure or partially post-procedure, they won't have a full return to function. They just have a removal of the cause of their dysfunction. The inadequate follow-up after treatment is included in that. And I want to link that one to improper medication dose or method use and ask you this question, which we do ask in our, our medication errors program, is when you prescribe a medicine, do you have a five-step process of introducing that medicine, making sure that the patient will take that medicine correctly, make sure that that medicine doesn't have any negative interactions or harmful or adverse interactions with other um, medications that they're taking, ensuring that they comply properly and stop properly. So often you'll, you may, not that you would, but you may uh, prescribe some medicines and the patient starts taking them, how do you know that they're not having an adverse outcome? Are you following up on each patient that you've given a prescription to one or two days later to see that they are thriving and not having a poor outcome from the uh, side effects of those uh, potential medications? So that's something to think about as we go forward. When we look at reducing lawsuits or reducing disputes as a result of medical errors, the uh, recurrent theme, is a lack of efficient communication. And I'm also gonna add the effective communication between the, the, the P's. And I call them the P's because it's a patient and it's a practitioner, but you're actually both people, the three P rule. So you're both people, 
you as the person providing the care and somebody else as the person receiving the care, when you leave the practice, you're still both people. When we look at root cause, in other words, what could lead to the cascade that's led to an error, that's led to negligence, that's led to perceived malpractice. Communication is at the cause or at the source of root cause. So what I'd like to suggest to you here, for those of you that uh, like to do additional research, um, I would like to suggest that um, I'd like to suggest that you you go online and and you um, download a YouTube video on root cause analysis. And this root cause analysis video is specifically on a uh, young child who died uh, called Michael Columbini. It's a case already that's fairly dated, but it's a landmark case in MRI safety. This is a young boy who's playing in the playground falls down in the playground and they worry that he's got a um, cranial fracture and that he's got a subdural hematoma. When they do the investigations, the good news is he doesn't have a subdural hematoma. The bad news is that he does have a tumor. They crack the skull, they excise the tumor and post-surgery, this young boy and the anesthesiologist go down into the MR um, suite to go and do a post-operative assessment of um, what went on. Through a series of unfortunate circumstances, that child needs oxygen. The oxygen in the, in the MR suite is not working. The technician goes to the back where he's acoustically separated from the anesthesiologist who is starting to become increasingly anxious because the patient is crashing and there's no oxygen. A nurse who's walking by outside hears this and runs in to assist the anesthesiologist and takes an, a, met, a, a metal oxygen cylinder in with her. Because the unit is energized, the oxygen cylinder is pulled into the unit and it hits the boy on the head a few times and the boy succumbs to his injury and dies. The root cause analysis is to say, who was at fault? What caused the fault? Was the fault that the anesthesiologist didn't check the oxygen before putting the boy in the unit? Was the fault because the technicians didn't check the oxygen before allowing the anesthesiologist and the boy into the unit? Was the fault that the technicians were not in line of sight and, and, and able to hear? Was the fault that the nurse ran in with the oxygen cylinder and didn't have the sufficient training? Was the fault that the uh, installer and maker of the MR unit didn't have a failsafe and a backup? Was the fault that the hospital didn't secure access that a nurse with good intentions but with poor training couldn't enter in to um, bring that cylinder in? So that's what a root cause analysis is. And it's, it's worth having a look at that and then asking those questions in your practice. Do you have areas where a patient may or may not be exposed to a cascade of, of, of um, sequencing or actions that could lead to an outcome where had you communicated better, they would be uh, more in control? And so here I refer you back to um, the Health Professions Council guidelines, booklet one on your ethical responsibilities and booklet four on informed consent. Because if you apply those, the likelihood of there being communication errors is significantly less. And then as I said to you on, on a previous slide, when we spoke about the psychological stresses, it's important to understand that stress associated with residual disability. And that could be as a result of the disease or as a result of the treatment creates a sense of dissatisfaction and anxiety in the patient. And the only direction that they can send that to is to yourself as the practitioner. And that's why, again, your communication and your informed consent is really important. So I mentioned this to you earlier, perioperative anxiety is the most frequent emotional factor prevalence in patients. That's seven to eight out of 10 of your patients who you do a procedure with will have preoperative or pre-procedural anxiety. That's a very good predictive factor in the outcome of moderate to severe post-operative or post-procedure pain. And that post-operative or post-procedure pain significantly increases the likelihood of a complaint. Add a bill that's received that the patient has to pay on top of that perceived pain and you have a recipe for a, um, a conflict situation developing. So, at this point, before we shift into um, the component where we're going to talk about social media risks, in terms of self-reflection, describe the care that you would usually deliver if you had adequate time. 
call it the perfect care environment. You're seeing one patient an hour, you've got ample time, or one patient in two hours, depending on how long your, your, your consultation. But if you had ample time, what would it look like? If at times you don't deliver that care, because timing is short, or there's pressure, or there's a language barrier, or there's an emergency, or whatever your reason could be, what are the types of care that you leave out that are omitted? And what types of clinical care are regularly missed and why? Do you regularly check weight, height, blood pressure, pulse, SpO2, and uh, run a tracer as a standard initial consultation and every consultation after? Do you regularly do informed consent? Or do you revise your informed consent if you haven't seen a patient every 90 days? Those are questions. Then what would that admitted care look like in terms of how it may or may not affect the patient? And how would these emissions be prevented? The reason that this is your self-reflection is because I can't suggest to you how to improve your practice because I don't know how you run your practice, but you do. And so by understanding where your practice may be vulnerable, you may be able to improve one or two types of engagements, not necessarily your diagnostic acuity, but your patient communication and practice management style. So let's talk about social media risk for a second. When I, when I started in practice, the idea of the internet was still nascent, it was still growing. When I did my first uh, research, my, my research was on the effects of spinal manipulative therapy on uh, patients with low back pain with radiculopathy. And if I wanted a research article, I would rush off to the library and I would handwrite the request for that article and I would give it to the librarian who would post it to the library in question, who would then go and make a photocopy of that with permission and they would post it back to my library and I would get a call two to four weeks after my request and hopefully the uh, research article that was in the envelope that would, had been posted to me was the correct article. Nowadays, I go online and I can search any one of several hundred research repositories in order to find the kind of articles that are relevant to the research that I'm doing or the clinical care that I wish to give. But if that's true for me, it's also true for the patient. And so I found a point uh, not so long ago where patients would come in and they would say, I've got this pain. And because I've got this pain, I went online and I checked this pain and this pain is suggestive of this. So if you'll indulge with me, I'll give you a story from this week. The patient says to me, I wake up and I've got pain and it starts between my shoulder blades, mid spine, comes into the front. I feel a sense of breathlessness. I feel a sense of anxiety. I've got to, I get clammy and I'm really concerned that I'm having a, uh, myocardial infarction because these symptoms match my search. When we did the physical examination and, 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 and went through a journey which included her having uh, her, her cardiac assessments done with a cardiologist, we found that she had a sternochondritis. Now, those are quite different from each other. And while the one does lead to the other, the challenge of your medical degree versus their Dr. Google are quite different from each other. And so that brings us into really where social media risk becomes relevant or less or more relevant. So if you have a look at the screen in front of you now, quite a colorful slide. My question would be, how many of these icons do you recognize? There's Facebook, there's Twitter, there's YouTube, um, there's Instagram, there's Google, there's Yahoo, there's a whole lot of others. And now we, we live in a world where communication is if not instant, almost instant. And there are some difficulties. If, if you see there, you'll see Twitter and Instagram. And Twitter is, is, is the uh, light blue icon with a white bird, and the one next to it is Instagram. I know that because it's Insta on it, and somebody told me that. But if you're posting an opinion on those sites, those opinions can and have got us as medical practitioners into a lot of hot water over a lot of time. So. Social media includes our social networking sites, which include Facebook, MySpace, Google+, Twitter. They include professional networking sites like LinkedIn, uh, communication sites like WhatsApp, 
media sharing sites like YouTube and Flickr, content production sites, knowledge and information uh, aggregation sites. How many of you, when you look something up, go on to um, your web browser and it takes you to Wikipedia? So let's understand that, that social media does have a potential to get us into difficulty. And to, to share with you a quote from uh, Professor Tim Noakes, spreading scientific information is not medical advice. Now that comes out of a long, significantly difficult um, process that involved the Health Professions Council. And because it involved social media and professional networking sites, it also included opinions from the public, not only in South Africa, but worldwide. So you need to be mindful that anything you share in terms of social networking and in terms of social media, not only has to be compliant in terms of uh, booklets one and two of your ethical conduct as a practitioner and your requirements in terms of, of your registration, but also in terms of informed consent, booklet four, in terms of the sharing and protecting of, of, of private and, and uh, related and patient information, booklet five. It also includes your record keeping, which is booklet nine, and in terms of social uh, media, it also includes the social media guidelines that you need to be aware of in terms of booklet 16, in addition to the telemedicine guidelines, if you are providing consultations using a social media platform. So there's a joke at this point that I like to share. It's about the, um, the medical practitioner, you or me. We go to a, a party in the days when we could still socialize and we went um, having to do skellum parties because of, of, of COVID restrictions. Not that any of you break those restrictions, but um, the practitioner goes up to, to somebody else at the party who's a legal practitioner. And I always joke and I say, I apologize to people who have a medical back, background because I have a legal background. And then I apologize to the legal people because I have a medical background. So I, I, I wear both, um, both shoes on that. So the practitioner says to the, the legal person, it's so frustrating. I come to these parties and every time I come here, somebody comes up and asks me advice. I don't know what to do about it. What do you think I should do? And the lawyer turns to the doctor and says, well, no problem. What you should do is whenever somebody asks you for advice, you should send them a bill. And three days later, the practitioner gets his bill. So in this case, when we look at social media, internet based tools are social media and any internet based tool that allows individuals and communities to gather and communicate, to share information, to share ideas, to um, send personal messages and images and other content, and to sometimes collaborate with other users in real time is part of social media. So bear in mind that when we look at the National Health Act, that National Health Act defines a person who seeks and receives care from a registered practitioner as a user. So in this case, bear in mind that um, social media presents risks, potential and real risks to patients and healthcare practitioners regarding not only the distribution of poor quality information and the damage to, to potential damage to uh, your professional reputation, but uh, also to uh, breaches of patient privacy and the blurring of personal and, and, and uh, professional boundaries. So I ask you these questions as we go forward, but how many of you are using social media, like a WhatsApp communication or a virtual communication or have your patients connect with you on Facebook or other social media sites in a non-professional capacity? Because there is a, um, a book on the left-hand side of the screen here, this book, which you can buy at, um, most book outlets says, don't film yourself having sex and other legal advice for the age of social media. So if you don't want content about yourself to go onto social media, don't take that content about yourself because anything else that you share, once it's in a digital space is almost impossible to redact because those of you that use WhatsApp and I, I use this as an example because you can write something on WhatsApp. The other person can read it and you can delete it, but they would have already copied it and potentially sent it to somebody else. So even though you deleted it from, to me, what you sent, I may have already sent it to three colleagues who would have sent it to their colleague networks. And suddenly a comment that you've made about another colleague 
or a photograph that you've shared about a patient or a statement that you've made about a patient can go and spread significantly quickly. So, so be mindful of, of the risk that that brings. Social media, whilst growing in a minority of physicians who, who use social media, also um, becomes important because we use social media for learning. We're using social media today to speak about um, uh, medical errors and social media risks. This is a form of education. And we're finding that as we've moved forward, one of the things that COVID has done is it's rapidly increased the amount of uh, information that we're sharing on digital platforms and social media. It's changed the mechanisms of how we're learning. It's changed the mechanisms of, of what we're understanding. So I get things like this that come through from time to time, just to, to show you. I'll get this, uh, this picture. And the picture comes through like the one on the, on the um, left-hand side. And the question that I'm asked is, what do you think? The minute I've read this, I've actually entered into a therapeutic relationship with this patient because I've looked at it now. Then they say, do I need care and what should I do? Now you can see the trees in the background here. You can see that it's been held up. And you look at that and you're only seeing one angle. Now does this patient have a fracture? Do they have a dislocation of the acromioclavicular joint? Do they have an anterior dislocation of the glenohumeral joint? You cannot see only in a single image. So if a patient writes to you and says, what do you think? you should have a standardized response to them where you're giving feedback that says, thank you for sharing this with me. My rules of engagement or my practice engagement requirements are A, B, and C. If this is an emergency, you need to do D, E, and F, or you can make a consultation with me in the manner of G, H, and I. And I say that because if you're using your social media platform, like a WhatsApp, and you're not using WhatsApp for business, or you're not using Skype for business, or you're not recording adequately your virtual consultations, you may find yourself in a position where it's difficult to defend the um, diagnosis or the advice. And one of, one of the first times I did this, I was, I was speaking at a um, symposium for pediatric surgery, and one of the people in the front said, well, I get notes on LinkedIn where an unsolicited note comes and says, dear doctor, here are the conditions and the symptoms and the reports as they relate to my child. What should I do and can you help? If I don't respond to that person, I get a follow-up that says, why don't you care? Why aren't you helping? And why are you not interested in my child's health? And the, the, the practitioner, this is in a forum. They said, well, what should we do? My answer to that, and, and, and it's an informal position, is to say, you should not be doing unsolicited consultation on social media. The response would be, I acknowledge that you've communicated with me. If this is about a consultation or you would like a diagnostic opinion, please make an appointment with me on the following platform or using the following numbers. So I say that because I ask you the question and I say, well, where are you in, in, in terms of doing that? This study that you see in front of you here, this is an outcome of a study that was done by the American Medical Association. They looked at digital healthcare, which includes social media, because social media in, in includes digital platforms. And they looked at practice habits of 2016. They then reviewed that in terms of a follow-up study in 2019, and they published these results in February of this year. Of course, we, we can come to understand that from February of this year to July of this year, there's been a step change in how we do remote monitoring and, and, and other sorts of, of, of telehealth, given the circumstances we're in. But remote monitoring for improved care has grown significantly over the last couple of years. And in this case, where you're starting to look at the use of um, applications and devices, uh, smartphones, uh, smart watches, the ability uh, to communicate with, with uh, your chronic disease patients who've got hypertension or diabetes or asthma that requires uh, regular measurements of their vital signs, including weight and blood pressure and blood glucose. Uh, that's significantly changed. So 
when, when I started in practice, like I'm sure many of you did, I had a mercury sphygmomanometer and I had my stethoscope in and that was how I did the blood pressure. Now, what, what I'm seeing is you can buy a device, you put it on the index finger and it gives you pulse and it gives you blood pressure and to some extent it can give you a very high level tracer to look at arrhythmias and it gives you SpO2 all in one device. That device can speak to your smartphone, which can then download to my smartphone or to one of my devices. Now that allows us to improve care. It increases patient safety. It also increases and improves patient adherence. It gives us real time information, allows us to work more efficiently. In many cases, it improves the patient doctor relationship or is perceived to do so because that remote care and the improved communication keeps us close. So this is an example of how they are very positive aspects to working with um, uh, digital platforms and social media. Let's understand that equal to that, there are dangers in, in, in the use of social media. One of these is that there are significant amounts of um, spam accounts and that there are a lot of social uh, networking profiles that are targeted for identity theft. The, the third, in terms of burglars using networking sites to target vacant homes, in your case, they may be using social networking sites to target your practice and access to your practice records, which are in some ways kept online. So if you're keeping uh, electronic medical records online and you're in keeping uh, patient records or patient notes on your laptop or on your handset, or you're keeping communications on your handset, be mindful that there are dangers to social media and you should at the very least be using two-step authentication, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Bear also in mind that you may have patients who cyber stalk you on social media. You may also, on the flip side of that, be exposed to seeing information about people on a social site that they don't disclose to you in your therapeutic environment where, where there's therapeutic privilege. You may also have a conflict because what you see on the social site and what they've disclosed to you could be different. And now how do you reconcile those two together? So an example of, of, of um, where these kind of, of circumstances come through, I got a phone call from a police station a couple of, of, of years back where they called and they said, we'd like to speak to Dr. Byron. I said, well, this is me. They said, well, we're so-and-so from this police station. You know, when, when, when somebody from a police station calls you and introduces themselves as the uh, inspector and they're calling you in your professional capacity, I don't know about you, but my blood ran cold. And I said, well, what can I do? How can I help you? They said, well, this phone was handed in. And when we opened up the phone, which meant that it didn't have two-step authentication or passwords on it, we found a communication. The last communication was between whoever owns this phone and yourself and so we've called your number to get a hold of you. Now, that could very well be a handset that's stolen that has patient communication on it that you haven't protected. If there's patient information on it and that patient information results in that patient being identified or identifiable, and it leads to them being harmed in any way in terms of their reputation or in terms of uh, information being shared, you could directly or indirectly be held accountable for that. So bear in mind that social media does bring within it risks. So here are six steps to, to, to stay safe as it relates to how you manage your social media um, devices. Each account should have a strong password. Now, in theory, that's good. But in practice, we don't use strong passwords. We use our birth dates or our names or... Um, other commonly used things like password one, two, three, or one, two, three password. Be mindful of what you share with who, because people often use what you share for identity theft. Also, the moral hazard of no good deed goes unpunished is you may share on a social media platform within a closed group patient information as it relates to uh, some uh, CPD or some therapeutic. Um, a clinical sharing group, but somebody else in that group may know that patient, identify that patient, and share that information with a group that's outside of what you intend. Also check your privacy settings. Make sure that you've got uh, two-factor authentication, preferably some biometric and a password, and maybe a one-times password as well. 
so that people can't hack into your system. Be aware that sometimes clicking on links or installing apps allows there to be a backdoor for people with, with less good intentions than yours uh, to access your system and by doing that potentially do identity theft. So a little bit of self-reflection that um, I would like you to think about is please understand that healthcare providers who observed or were involved in an incident, and it could be an actual or a perceived incident that affects you or a colleague, have significantly higher levels of anxiety and secondary traumatic stress, including uh, depression and burnout. Directly experiencing an event radically or profoundly increases your anxiety and depression levels. And uh, more so when coworkers are perceived to be low in supportiveness. When I've spoken to a lot of, of, of our colleagues who've gone through a disciplinary procedure or an HBCSA review, or had to participate either directly or in giving evidence against another colleague, that practitioner invariably perceives that there was a low level of support from their colleagues and their often their society and association. When that happens, your risk of PTSD increases profoundly. So bear in mind that, that none of us wake up in the morning and say, we're going to harm someone today. So those feelings of guilt and shame, the feelings of anxiety, fear and depression, especially in the culture where we expect ourselves to be perfect in every way, plays a significant role in our own sense of, of self-worth. And when we're feeling bad, we share that with others. So we've, we've spoken to this, a perceived or an actual medical error can significantly contribute to your mental and emotional um, state and can affect you, it can affect your family, it can affect your loved ones, it can affect your practice. So be mindful of burnout. Some of the signs of burnout, lack of concentration, your poor work performance, post-traumatic stress disorder, signs of addiction, and signs of addiction are not limited to alcohol and substance use. It can be gambling, it can be substance misuse, it can be rage, it can be codependency, it can be workaholism, uh, it can be shopaholism. So bear in mind that there is a lot, including um, the, the suicide ideation. And a colleague of mine, a, a, an attorney who works very closely with, with Genoa, Romani Sutherland, spends a lot of time doing work with practitioners on managing their sense of futility, depression, and, and, and suicide ideation. So I said to you in the beginning that I'm gonna take us back to the Van Bacon Lewis case. And part of this is to understand that what you record is as important as what you do. So the question is, are you taking good clinical notes? And I refer you to, to booklet nine on uh, record keeping so that you can reflect on that. Also understand that Courts regard us as human beings. We're not machines, that we do make mistakes. And there is a very good book called um, To Err is Human. Um, but we are held by the standards of what the reasonable practitioner in our circumstance with our training would do. So I want to say thank you very much. I hope this hasn't been a long hour for you. I hope it's been a constructive hour. And MJ, I'm going to hand back to you at this point to answer any questions anyone may have before we close out today. Thanks very much, Brad, for once again giving us a very, very interesting presentation. I'm sure that I speak on behalf of the attendees that um, it was incredibly insightful. Maxwell, I'm not sure whether your um, sound is working at the moment. I'm going to give you one last opportunity just to uh, thank the members on behalf of MB. Um, if you can, I'll give you 30 seconds just to see whether you can get your sound working. So if, if not, then what we're going to do, doctors, is hand over to yourselves um, to see whether anyone has got any questions for Brad. In order to speak, uh, the easiest way to do it is um, just to hold down your space bar, which will demute everyone, um, and you can raise your questions directly with Brad. Whilst Maxwell is uh, attempting to get the sound working, I just uh, also want to advise that uh, in the coming days, you will be contacted by Wollandjela Financial Services. So that'll be uh, Tumi's entire team. They've got, a, they've got a number of medical malpractice specialists and they'll be arranging the delivery of your certificates, your CPD certificates for, for the attendance at this event where you'll get one CPD point. 
Um, I'm going to get back to him a few more seconds to see whether he's resolved his technical issues. Maxwell, you there? We still can't hear you, sir. Um, I can see you, but I can't. Um, I can't hear you. No, no sound, Maxwell. Very strange, eh? I don't know what's going on. Um, all right, doctors, over to you. Is anyone, does anyone have any questions for Dr. Byra? If not, we will wrap up the morning and uh, everyone must have a fantastic Saturday in all the different parts of the world that you, uh, world and South Africa that you find yourself in. Uh, so the question was, and, and Shona, thank you for the question. Can I list the books that I recommend? Um, I'm happy that we share them with you, but very briefly, um, the first series of books is by uh, Atul Gawanda. And the first book is called The Checklist Manifesto. He wrote two other books that are also worth reading. Uh, one is called uh, Better, which was his second book on uh, continuous clinical improvement. The third book was called Complications. Reflection on why they don't always work. There's a book on, uh, medic, on, on medical errors and the practices that we run. That's called To Err is Human. There's also a book around communication, which was written by the ex-chairman of a uh, large health organization called Casa Permanente. And that book is called From Chaos to Care. I have other books as well that I'll share with you anytime. Fantastic. Um, what we will do as well, doctors, is that we will share that list of books with you um, in the thank you mail that will follow probably on Monday morning. All right, Maxwell, I don't think, uh, I don't know what the technical difficulties are that we're having there, but um, yeah, I think we, we from Juno's side, I'd just like to thank you for putting, putting the event together um, and for, for arranging the attendees. Um, all right, Brad, I don't think that we've got any other questions, so I think that we can, we can wrap up and everyone can enjoy the rest of their Saturdays. Thanks for, thanks again for, for giving us your insights into this topic. Thanks everyone. Have a great weekend. Alrighty. Ciao everyone. Keep well.